to have respect for the training, what we're doing right now. You give all your attention to it, and you give it top priority. And this is one of the reasons why we have so much bowing down around here. is to realize that the teaching the, the Buddha left behind is really important, something worth practicing, something worth preserving. Because a teaching like this is very hard to find. Something the Buddha gave out, is, out of his compassion, because he didn't need anything from anybody. On the night when he passed away, Davis were dropping flowers out of well, the celestial heavens, playing music. And he told one of the monks that this is not how you pay respect to the Buddha, or it's not the ideal way. The ideal way is to pay respect to the practice, practicing the Dharma in line with the Dharma. In other words, in line with the Buddha's original intent, which was to teach us how to gain release from suffering, and to wean us away from our old habits, our old eating habits. And that's one of the reasons why respect is so important, because we tend to respect our old eating habits, whether it's the, the food that we will and will not eat, and the habits we have. We really feed heavily on our habits. We don't like giving them up because we've gotten at least some nourishment from them in the past. But when the Buddha uses the word nibida, it's that sense of having eaten enough of that particular kind of food. He should say, I've seen what it can do and I can see its drawbacks. And you get to the point where you just don't want that kind of food anymore. It's like that apple juice we got the other day. Looked like apple juice. <laughs> but it was all high fructose corn syrup. And you think, why on earth? I mean, they use apple juice to sweeten other things. Why do they use, need to use high fructose corn syrup to sweeten apple juice? And it said on the label in very small letters, yes, 5% apple juice. And that's why the bottle was returned. In other words, you know what's there. You don't want it anymore. And yet if it's something that we really like or really go back to, or at least it's something we habitually go back to, it's hard to wean us off of that habit. Which is why the Buddha emphasized this value of respect so much. There's a nice passage where a monk comes to see the Buddha and talks about how difficult it was to accept some of the rules. You can imagine what it was like you ordained back in those days, and you weren't forewarned that there were going to be rules, because the Buddha hadn't formulated them yet. And then one by one by one these rules started coming out. And he talks about how it used to be they could eat three meals a day. They'd go for alms three times a day. You can imagine how oppressive that was for the, the people in the city, people in the countryside. And then the monk said, then the Buddha said, okay, stop that midday meal. And as the monk said, he was upset for about a day. But out of his respect and love for the Buddha, he decided to give it up. And then the Buddha said, give up the evening meal. That was even worse, because as he said, the best meal is usually the evening meal. People will save special food for the evening meal. But again, out of love and respect for the Buddha, they gave it up. And then he began to realize all the benefits that came from that, particularly. Monks were not out going for alms in the dark of night. He said in the past when monks were going for alms at night time, they'd run into hooligans either on the way from having committed a crime or on the way to committing a crime. Of course, that was dangerous. Women would proposition them. Sometimes they'd fall into cesspools. And my favorite one is they, but sometimes they would trip over a sleeping cow. 
he tells the story of one evening he was waiting for alms outside a house, and a servant woman was washing some pans, and there was a lightning flash, and she suddenly saw him. She hadn't realized he was there. And he said, oh my gosh, the demon's after me. He says, I'm not a demon, I'm a monk waiting for alms. And so she said, well, you're, you're a monk whose mother's dead and whose father's dead, and it'd be better if your belly be slashed open with a knife than to go around prowling around at night looking for food for your belly's sake. And the monk concludes as he tells the Buddha, there's so many unpleasant things that these rules have freed us from, and so many pleasant things they provided. So it's good to think about that, thing. our old ways of eating, even though we like them and we feel upset when we have to give them up. It's good to have a good basic respect for the Buddha, good basic respect for the Dhamma and the Sangha, because that helps get you over your disinclination to abandon your old ways of feeding. And it's only then you begin to realize what really is better this way. So respect is one of the ways that you motivate yourself to abandon unskillful habits and work on skillful ones. So as the Buddha said, have, have some respect for the triple training, the precepts. Have some respect for merit-making. This is one aspect of the tradition that Westerners tend to look down on. We feel that well, we can go straight to discernment. And those poor people who are just so greedily looking after merit, they've missed the whole point. Well, no. They understand something that many of us don't understand, which is that one of the ways of subduing your defilements is to be willing to give something away, to be willing to do just basic everyday kinds of things as a gift, to observe the precepts, to develop goodwill. All these forms of making merit are really essential for developing the character qualities we need as meditators. And this willingness to give, the willingness to be generous. When that becomes a habit, then when we come to the meditation, we're a lot more willing to give of our time, give of our energy, and be patient with the results. I've told you that story of John Sawat, that retreat at IMS. After the second or third day, he turned to me and said, you know, everybody here looks pretty grim. And his analysis of why was because they didn't have a good background in virtue and generosity. So a day or two later, I gave a talk on virtue and generosity. We actually had someone leave the retreat. He said he hadn't come here for religion, he'd come here to train his mind. Well, not realizing that virtue and generosity are important parts of training the mind. Or again, at the end of the retreat, when people asked John Swan about meditation and daily life, he talked about the five precepts. And again, some people were upset, thinking that he was looking down on them, that lay people couldn't really meditate and all they could handle was the five precepts. He's making an important point that adhering to the precepts is a form of meditation. And when we try to skip over the steps, we're not really prepared for them. Virtue teaches re restraint, it teaches mindfulness, it teaches alertness. It teaches you to be sensitive to your actions. One of our problems is that when we do something that's unskillful, we have a good excuse. But here are some precepts that say, no, no excuses at all. And it's good to train the mind that way, to have respect for the principles of virtue. So it's good to have respect for all aspects of the path, because they're all needed for a complete training.
And if something is missing, okay, there's going to be something missing in the results. Our modern tendency is to pare things down, to reduce everything to what we think is essential. But many times we drop the essentials without realizing it. So look at your practice. See which aspects of the path you're not really respecting. And try to show them a little respect. There's more there than meets the eye.